I hated everything about you in those early days. Your pouty lips, those big blue eyes, that brown wavy hair. I looked in the mirror at my dark eyes and thin dark brown hair. My stomach wasn't as flat as yours. But then, you looked at me that day in the bathroom of the old school and smiled. From then on, I was in love. It was probably the reason I hated you. You were so beautiful. I wanted to hold you and I wanted to kiss you. You flattered me and told me you liked my homemade stickers on my book bag. You asked me if I could teach you how to make them. I nodded shyly. We began to see more and more of each other there in the halls of our mildew-smelling school. I tried pretending I was like everyone else, that I liked football, and I guess I did. It was what you do in high school. You watch the girls flirt with the guys. It's so rewarding to them when girls like you bat your eyelashes at them. You sit with me at the football game and ignore the social norms, and you touch my hand and ask me if I want a pretzel or a coke. I nod my head again, shying away from what must be your smile. How is it that you see me, Bridget? I'm just Maxie Waters, the girl that lives on Pinehurst Lane, and I'm the girl nobody notices. You are taking longer than I expected you to. I look at my phone and realize you've been gone for minutes longer than you should. I stand up, but I can't see you. I look around, but it's dark near the bleachers, yet under them I see shadows. Who is he? How could you kiss him? Wait, then I see him. He's, he's holding you down. You're crying and, and I pick up a rock. Once, twice, and then again, and again, I bash his skull in. You're looking at me like I'm a monster now. Why are you looking at me like this? I'm taken away and I'm not allowed to see you. All through the trial, you just cried. You never bothered to even look at me. How is this my fault when I was only trying to save you? I send you letters, but you never respond. Sometimes I get them back with a message. Return to sender. I hide my tears from the world now. Tomorrow, I'll show you and everyone else. I'll show you what I can do. I made a little gift for that guard, and when he comes to revisit me tonight, I'll make sure he never touches the other girls or me again. I'll be everyone's savior when I escape from here. I'll see you soon, Bridget, and I'll show you, too, that I'm more than Maxie Waters, the girl that lives on Pinehurst Lane. Last journal entry. They say the hardest part of killing someone is looking in their eyes. Experts and shrinks like to believe and say that it's because you can see yourself as the victim and the horror they're experiencing. Or, if the killer enjoys it, still, then he or she is a psychopath, monster, sick, evil, etc. Even in interrogations, when they ask the killer why, he or she always goes on and on about how he or she enjoyed doing this and that and how it felt or gave them the feeling of power, etc. This is because we as a race want to believe that some of us are good and some of us are evil, although we all know the truth. We feel it in us. The capability of killing and, even more horrifying, the desire to kill. What if I told you that they killed the way they did and said what they said to protect humanity? What if I told you that they never wanted to kill anyone and wanted to live a normal, peaceful life like all of you good people? What if I told you that I killed the way that I did and said what I said to protect all of you good people? What if I told you that we didn't see ourselves in the victim's eyes? Instead, we see. We don't just see ourselves. I've talked to other killers, despite their reluctance to say it or admit it. They all said that they too have seen him have served him, and were his victims as well. What I'm about to tell you is what I learned from all of them. His real name is unknown, if he even has one. As far as we can tell, he's been around since the beginning of mankind. You can never say his name or talk about him to anyone that isn't a killer, otherwise, he'll come for you. He doesn't want to be known or discovered. He gives you a proposal. Kill as many times as I say, how I say it, 
or I'll make your family and you kill yourselves, or I'll have someone else kill you and your family. He claims that every tragedy, massacre, and war that's happened was because we didn't listen to him before. No one knows how he gets in your head or why he chooses you. God and the devil may not exist, but he does. When he comes to you, you are overwhelmed with this weight or pain in your head and over your body, a weight and pain you will do anything to get rid of. Then you hear his voice. God damn that voice. A mocking, light, haunting, echoing whisper. With his rounded rectangular head, with creased skin covering every inch of his body, his small, sharp chin, and a smile. Oh, that goddamn, mocking, never-ending smile that takes up half his face with uneven teeth. Not crooked, uneven teeth. He has two large, perfect circles for eyes with one small pupil. Sometimes they're bloodshot, sometimes they're not. A pencil-thin, veiny neck, broad shoulders, a thin waist, black Civil War uniform mixed with a samurai robe with no rank or name, and on his shoulders is a patch with three spikes. You never see his legs or feet below his waist. He's ten feet tall and appears whenever and whenever he wants. You can't shut him out. You can't run. You can't sleep. You can't eat. You can't laugh. You can't breathe. You can't even fuck unless he says so. Unless you kill. Now, you can believe me or not, but when he comes for you, you'll know it's true. <laughs>